Welcome to the Testify Conversation. The event will be yeah, Good evening. To Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm Brian Madigan, an associate librarian at the Central Minneapolis Library of Hennepin County. This program is being presented as part of a series by the historical uh, by, the, by the history and sciences section of the Minneapolis Central Library. For this edition of our series during Black History Month, we are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Akika Tainer and Just Justice Alan Page to discuss the Diane and Alan Page Collections Testify exhibit, which was hosted at the Central Library in 2018, produced by, by the Diane and Alan Page Collection Director, Georgie Page Smith. The Testify exhibit was the most well-attended exhibit in the history of the cargo gallery at the Central Library. With over a hundred items presented, the exhibit challenged attendees to come up, uh, excuse me, to come to grips with the past as they considered the ongoing racial tensions in the United States. Dr. Artika Tyner is the founding director on the Center on Race, Leadership, and Social Justice at the University of St. Thomas School of Law and a former Page Scholar. As well as being an educator, she is an author, lecturer, and an advocate for justice not only in her own community, but globally, working for education, entrepreneurship, and women's leadership initiatives in Africa. Justice Alan Page is well known for many aspects of his Minnesota life. He was an Associate Justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court for 22 years, the first African American to do so. In 1988, he and his wife Diane founded the Page, uh, Page Education Foundation. The foundation provides financial and mentoring assistance to students of color in exchange for those students' commitment to further volunteer their service in the community. The first time I really became aware of Justice Page while I was, was while I was running the Twin Cities Marathon. The first time I ran it, I passed a spectator playing the tuba to inspire runners as they came running up the hill from Hennepin Avenue. The runners that passed them would, ye would yell out uh, thank yous to the tuba guy. The next year, I ran it again, and the tuba guy was there in the same spot. The day after that race, I picked up the paper and I saw a picture of the tuba guy, and it turns out it was Justice Alan Page. Now, I'm not exactly someone who runs in the front of the pack of any race, so I have no idea how many thousands of runners he's encouraged to finish the 26th mile haul. To me, that stands as a small testament to his giant dedication to making the community better. Another way Alan and Diane Page have done this is by curating the items that have become part of the Testify exhibit and then sharing their knowledge with the library community who can now experience these items and the history they hold. We invite you to share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A on the right-hand side of the screen. If you don't see a Q&A section on the right-hand side of the screen, look for an icon with a question mark on top. To submit a question or comment, press the Ask a Question button and type your question or comment and click the Send button. Along with questions and comments, other information will pop up with more about Testify's exhibits and links and related sites. Now to start us on a virtual exploration of Testify, I will turn it over to Dr. Tyner. Thank you, I appreciate that warm welcome. And I just want to make sure that I say good evening and remind everyone of the importance of even the word testify. It's about bearing witness. It's about challenging inequities and really making a difference. So tonight you are in for a great honor and a privilege to be able to learn and explore in partnership with Justice Alan C. Page. So let's get started with the first item that is a part of the testify exhibition. This is labeled as the White House brick. We know that the White House brick was made by an enslaved uh, African person. Um, it dates back to 1792 to 1800. Uh, we know that the bricks were quarried and cut by enslaved people that were laid into the foundation for the presidential residence and the US Capitol buildings, which were also often dug by enslaved people. In these bricks is evidence of the fundamental role served by African Americans in establishing um, the wealth and prosperity of this country. Through this piece of stone, it may seem inert. It is a monument to those uncompensated and unsung laborers to whom we owe at least a moral debt. So I have a question and we'll begin with some questions for Justice Page. And looking at this photo of the White House brick, what does this brick mean to you? Well, when I see it, I think of all those people who um, 
were a part of creating this country, but who came here in the belly of slave ships owned by other human beings. Yet they were conscripted to make, um, to build, if you will, the very house that is the symbol of our democracy, the White House. There's, you know, there's a contradiction in that, just as there is a contradiction in our um, Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution. When you think about it, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, while at the same time, people were held in bondage by the very people who wrote those words. And so when we fast forward to today and wonder how it is that these many years later we are still in conflict with who we are as a nation and how we treat those who are different from us. Um, it, is, it is no wonder that that conflict still exists. First of all, everything that we do today in terms of the law, in terms of our guiding principles, are grounded in our Constitution, a Constitution that um, characterized somebody like me, who looked like me, as three-fifths of a person. And so when I see this um, artifact, all of those things come back to me and 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 make me ask the question how do we move on from that because until we move on from that history uh, i fear we are doomed to continue to repeat it thank you justice page so you see in this process of testifying we even have a challenge how do we move past many of the conflicts that we see and not be bound to repeat the mistakes of history as well? So Justice Page, as we know as African-Americans being at the foundation of America, building our infrastructure, building the economy, based upon your experiences and based upon the reflections that you've just given, can you give us a sense? We know you've been to the White House several times. What is your experience and how do you feel knowing um, how it was built and by whom? Well, it is that conflict because the White House, in a sense, is our hope for a better future. Yet it is grounded, as is our history, in uh, a system of enslavement. And so the times that I've been there, I've had mixed feelings. Uh, my, actually, I've been there three times under three different presidents. The first time I was there in uh, the late 90s when uh, Bill Clinton, President Clinton was president. Diane and I were there in uh, 2015, I believe, for the annual holiday party with uh, when President Obama was president. And then I was there in 2018 when um, former President Trump was president. In each of those situations, um, there is a sense of history, but a, a, a sense of history that has a shadow cast upon it. Those first two visits 
I will say the first of the first time I was there was for a, an education conference. Uh, after the shootings at Columbine. Um, and there was a, a, a sense of. We're better than this, we can do better than this. There was a sense of. We don't have to be. Who we were back in the 1790s. Or who we seem to be heading towards in the late 1990s. In 2015, when Diane and I were there, there was a sense of hope and optimism that we'd had our first African American president, that um, the future was ours to to create, ours to change. 2018, I go there and I go because I was there to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but I go because the voices of the enslaved people who made this brick, their voices need to be represented in the White House. I went because those who gave their lives um, through the Jim Crow years with lynchings and hangings, um, their voices need to be heard, needed to be heard. Those who died trying to uh, obtain voting rights for all Americans their voices needed to be heard. And quite frankly, it was a dark time and it continues to be a dark time. We've had, a, sadly, we had a, a, a president who played on racial stereotypes and racial fears, who um, catered to those who would enslave me and made it easy for those whose bigotry was really hidden behind the curtain, made it easy for them to feel comfortable stepping out in front of the curtain. And, um, but yet, there is hope that we as a people can live together, can treat each other fairly, and that our history does not have to define us and confine us. Thank you, Justice Page. So we're getting a clear reminder about the possibility of hope and optimism for the future but really a call to action for all of us. So the next piece that we'll look at is the Lincoln banner. We know that this is Abraham Lincoln's funeral banner from 1864 to 1865 or the related dates. And it says with that, with text that reads, Uncle Abe, we shall not forget you on one side and our community shall be one country on the other. This linen banner has a hand carved pole and a pig metal lantern at the top so that it could be carried at night. Research suggests that it was either created to greet the train carrying the slain President Lincoln as his body traveled across the country, or as another historian has suggested, it may have been carried in marches by freed men and women preceding the election of 1864. So Justice Page, how did you come by this Lincoln uh, banner and why is it especially meaningful to you? Well, the words, our country shall be one country. It is a hopeful piece. It is also historic. I mean, think about it. It existed in 1864, 1865. The Civil War 
was either ongoing or just ended. It commemorates Abraham Lincoln, whose uh, legacy is complicated like all legacies, yet who signed the Emancipation Proclamation, who um, gave us the Gettysburg Address, who on the one hand led the war to end slavery and to end our divided nation, and on the other hand, um, his relationship with our indigenous brothers and sisters calls into question all of that. We came across the, the banner. Um, we were actually in visiting uh, one of our daughter's soccer games back in, must have been 1996, 1997 in Chicago. She was at Northwestern playing uh, soccer and we were in town for the weekend. Diane was an avid collector. She's the one who co has collected all of these artifacts from the slave brick uh, to this uh, banner. And we had some downtime and opened up the phone book and started looking for uh, antiques and antique items and artifacts. And she picked up the phone, called the number, and the people said, yeah, we have some things you might be interested in. Uh, come on over. We went over to their home uh, in suburban Chicago uh, and saw a number of things that held a great deal of interest to us. And they said, oh, by the way, we have this one piece that we're packing up uh, to take to an antique show in New York over the holidays. Would you like to see it? And we thought, well, you know, why not? And it turns out to be the this banner. And my heart both sank and soared. The pain uh, that comes from the Lincoln legacy to the hope that our country shall be one country brings. Um, it was it was wrenching and I had an immediate connection to it. Uh, I think Diane did also and it was something that um, we decided that we had to have. And it was it was it was um, something that we hadn't quite been planning to spend that much money on. But um, given what it was and its history and its um, and really its hopefulness, our country shall be one country. That is that is the hope for the future, isn't it? Thank you. So let's take a closer look with Justice Page at the Lincoln banner. That piece that he just reminded us of, that our country shall be one country, represents a dream deferred, which shall not be denied. It took some 80 years after the Declaration of Independence was approved before a young lawyer from Illinois, in the wake of the Dred Scott decision, challenged the original sin of slavery and the ensuing moral degradation in a debate. And as we look at this closer, Justice Page, how do we connect some of these pieces of our country shall be one country, that unity and hope that you continue to emphasize? How do we connect it to the insurrection that we saw a few weeks ago? And how do we address a national divide? What should we do? Well, what we should do, and let me let me just back up for a minute. 
you mentioned Dred Scott, 1857, I believe. A case in which the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court wrote um, these words and with reference to those who, quote, had, had been imported as slaves, end quote. They have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. There is an element in our country that still believes that. That people who look like you and I have no rights which the majority is bound to respect. I think that group of people is a distinct minority. While they are a distinct minority, they are an active, vocal, and oftentimes violent minority. It is incumbent upon all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, no matter our station in life, whether we're male or female, um, whether we're young, old, black, white, indigenous, brown, we have to look internally at ourselves and ad identify our biases. And then in our relationships with other people, we have to be mindful of those biases and make sure that we treat people who are different from us based on who they are and what they do and not on some preconceived stereotype based on some sense of, well, those people or the other. Um, I think that's the only hope we have. And we have to be intentional about it. We can't just sort of go through life saying, well, this doesn't relate to me because it does relate to you. It relates to all of us. And how we act today and really every day will determine how much progress we make. We all, we all have a responsibility. The other thing we, I think we're gonna have to figure out how to do is stop segregating ourselves. I mean, if you think about it, we segregated it, we segregate ourselves in our uh, schools, our workplaces, our communities. And the only way I know to, to be able to relate to other people is to actually relate to them. Um, and so I see, you know, figuring out how to live together is really key. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in a speech that he gave in 1956, and I can't remember the, the exact quote, but what he was saying was, uh, you know, there's this perception that when we see somebody who is different from us, we walk down the street on the other side. He said, um, once that was considered to be moral failure, but in this world with its interconnectedness, continuing to do that will lead to universal suicide. That was in 1956 that he said that. We haven't made a lot of progress since then, but his words still ring true today.
So we're getting some reminders about challenging our own biases. About also Dr. King talked about that sin of indifference. We don't talk about it, but it goes beyond hate if I'm indifferent of your very existence and your human dignity and your well-being. So Justice Page, I, I'd like to continue on this theme. The next piece that we'll see is a campaign poster. And this is a theme on how to take action. So with this National Union ticket poster, it's from 1864. This piece is not from the Page collection, but illustrates further how divided the country was and how much voters still believe in unity. So the National Union Party was a temporary name used by the Republican Party and elements of other parties for the national ticket in the 1864 presidential election that was held during the Civil War. The temporary name was used to attract war Democrats, border states, unconditional unionists, and unionist party members who would not vote for the Republican Party. The party nominees were elected in an electoral landslide. So with the recent inauguration, we saw that there was a featured powerful youth poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, who shared her hope for that piece that you were able to emphasize for us that our country shall be one country, a united nation. So given that your work is really focused on how young people are our future, what is the most important thing that our youth can do to prepare themselves to lead change? I, I wish I had Amanda's words in front of me. Her last line said it all. And essentially it was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, if only we have the courage to be, if we have the courage to do, if we have the courage to act, that's what's gonna bring about change. And it, you know, not somebody else, it's us. And our hope has to be in young people because people of my generation have failed and failed miser miserably. Um, and I have a vested interest in this. I have um, four grandchildren who I would like to grow up in a world that accepts people who looks like them as they accept everybody else. And I would hope that they are being taught and learning how to treat other people the way they would like to be treated, with respect and with dignity. I think that is critical. I think the other thing that is critical for young people, but really for all people, is being honest, being truthful, saying what we mean, meaning what we say, treating people with respect, respecting ourselves. sorting out the difference between right and wrong and then doing what is right. Not because there's some advantage in it, but because it is the right thing to do. You know, being truthful and being honest, they are critical to our survival. If Truth is inextricably linked with trust. If I can't be truthful, how can I be trusted? I can't be. That is, that is critical to interpersonal relationships. And, um, I think it is vitally important 
that our young people understand that. And, and it's also important for our young people to understand that they have power. They can create change. They can put themselves in the position to make the future better than what it might otherwise be. They have control over that. That is important for all young people to know and understand. And, and, and let me just be clear. We don't always agree on everything. Uh, we don't always see the world from the same vantage point. But that's what brings the richness of who we are. I always like to think when when I was serving on the court. The advantage of being on a seven member court. Is that the decisions that get made are better because not everybody sees the same picture. We can and, and so everybody's got a little bit of a different view and may have a little bit of a different opinion. But we're all. Sort of confined to the same facts. We don't get to pick and choose the facts as we'd like them to be. We have to deal with the facts as they are. We can have our opinions about those, but we can't have our own facts. But when all those opinions come together, what comes out of that is a richness that um, you just can't get from having the views of one individual or one group of people. It requires um, the melting pot, if you will. So this takes us into our next bridge of looking at color barriers. So we just got a sense from Justice Page the importance of looking at the facts as they are. As we look at these signs, we see some facts about the nature of segregation and white supremacy. So segregation and its theoretical justification, separate but equal, reportedly emerged out of efforts by progressive Americans to uplift and protect First Peoples and African Americans. But in the 1870s, Southern states seized on the concept as a tool of oppression and began passing laws requiring the separation of whites from persons of color in public transportation and schools. Anyone with a drop of African ancestry or suspected African ancestry was considered a person of color. As segregation spread like a fungus, it was enforced in parks, cemeteries, theaters, and restaurants to prevent any contact between African Americans and whites. One scholar of the signage discovered a segregated pet cemetery, no Negro dogs near Washington, D.C., and Coke machines with separate coin slots for black and white customers. This photo shows various Jim Crow signs which were used to enforce segregation. Some are reproduction, some are original, Several of the signs refer to railways or transportation, a frequent site of the stratification of white supremacy insisted upon. When Testify was mounted at the Cargill Gallery, there wasn't a placard for this selection of signs. They were placed in the space so that visitors to the exhibit might be able to directly experience the discomfort of being told where to be and even being told how to be. Now, many are saying that we are in a period of a transition of that flux and change. They call it the third reconstruction. Justice Page has laid the foundation of this, of what scholars have identified these three layers of reconstruction. The first one being after the Civil War. The second one as it relates to what you see on the screen is related to the end of Jim Crow. And some say with the third reconstruction, it's really about the dual pandemics that we see of the novel pandemic of coronavirus and some of the disparities that we see are racial injustices. So as people are saying that we could be in this third reconstruction and that there's a need for atonement and reconciliation of making things right and there's a need for massive social change, how do we address this constant pattern of moving forward, 
and then retrenchment, moving forward and then retrenchment. What should we do and how do we remain focused on the future of that being that one country? I think you hit on it. We have to remain focused on the future. Understanding the past. Indeed, um, when we hear those who uh, are opposed to taking down the, the monuments and tributes to Civil War heroes, um, I say, you know, take them down, leave them up. Either way, just understand what you're paying tribute to. It is to a past that enslaved people and people who fought and died to maintain that status, to maintain that situation. And so um, what we have to do is stay ever vigilant. And I mean, put simply, we have to uh, not let our guard down and become complacent. I think a little of what we did that finds us where we are today, both in terms of uh, the express, the comfort people have in expressing their bigotry and in um, acting on their bigotry is a function of not remembering how we got to that point of comfort that we had. And so we can't lose sight of that. And I think it's important that all of us understand what that history is. You know, one of the things we don't do very well, if at all, is in our educational systems, we don't talk about um, our past, you know, our history in a way that is honest and open. We um, pretty much gloss over it, glorify a few people along the way, but never come to grips with what that history is. And uh, I think we need to understand that history so that we know who we are and how we got here. Thank you. So we heard it loud and clear. It sounds like we all have homework to do to understand the history. Don't let this piece related to traveling through the exhibition virtually tonight don't let it be the end of learning and engagement. Let it be ongoing. Now, Justice Page, I'm going to make this a bit um, authentic and personal for a moment. So oftentimes when I, I watch you and I try to watch everything from the football field to being on the bench to all of your interviews. So I, I'm an admitted bias there. You mentioned the word bias. Oh, I'm your number one fan. So with that we, being we all said, have our biases. <laughs> so I, I'm admitting it. Justice Page, I watched you in tense situations, whether it's violence and policing, uh, addressing the educational disparities in real meaningful ways. And one thing that always helps me to keep course, whether as an educator or as a civil rights attorney, is I'm thinking about how does Justice Page keep the right temperament, whether it's on the field and you're thinking about the mindset of you being an athlete, wherever you are, Despite the tension that you encounter, despite, despite the miseducation that you encounter, or sometimes we can call it the ignorance gap on some of these key issues, you are always consistent with the right temperament and uh, the ability to engage. Give us some tips on how you remain focused, Justice Page. Well, I don't know that I have any insight into that. It's something that is internal to me. Something that I learned a little bit about um, 
in my football playing days, you know, when it's 90 degrees, somebody's pounding on you, cussing at you, kicking you, um, and trying to beat you up. And the question becomes, do you focus on the heat? Do you focus on the person that's trying to beat you up? Do you focus on any number of other things or do you focus on the task at hand? And the only way to accomplish the task at hand is to focus on the task at hand, not be distracted. Because in those situations, the heat is a distraction. In those situations, your opponent is trying to take your attention away from what you're there to accomplish. So I did learn that, I think, from football. But I think the ability to focus is something that has just been internal to me. Um, but it, it it is also true in the law. Just use an example, if you're on the court and you're um, working on a case and, the, the, you know, there's opposition to your view. You can either get sidetracked with personalities. You can get sidetracked with. Um, well, this is too hard. This is not worth putting the effort in. But if you're going to. Do what you do as well as you can. You have to be able to remain focused. In the face of the things that can be really distracting. You know, the 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 bright lights over here, the sense of doom over here, um, all of those things exist, but um, you have to be able to not shut them out, but compartmentalize them and deal with those things at a time when it's appropriate to deal with them. But while you're working on the task at hand, stay focused on that. That has um, served me well throughout my life in all aspects of my life. And I, I used to be, um, I used to have a temper. I, I, I could throw temper tantrums with the best of them. Um, fortunately, I figured out that those temper tantrums, while they may or may not have made me feel better, didn't help me accomplish whatever it was I was trying to accomplish. Better to put the time, energy and effort into sorting out, OK, this hurdle or obstacle is in the way. How do I get over it, around it, under it, through it. How do I work through the problem? As opposed to being distracted by all those things which are, you know, very easily distracting. So and it, it and, and in, in fairness, I've also been fortunate to have grown up with a sense of self-confidence. Being able to assess who I am and what I am and what I'm doing and being comfortable with that, with doing the best that I can under the circumstances, trying to extend the circumstances, but recognizing that if I do the best I can, that's all I can do. But that may be all I can do, but it is also what I can do. I love that. I think that's a good reminder about what we can do and staying focused. So thank you for giving us those practical examples. I don't know about others who are watching in and learning, but I'm going to take it with me to be reminded 
about the importance of me remaining focused and disciplined on getting progress and understanding on the task at hand. So I really appreciate that. That's, that's good motivation for me. Our next piece that we'll talk about um, is a very timely and relevant. Justice Page has alluded to it in understanding the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. The text reads, we think the enforced separation of the races neither abridges the privileges or immunities of the colored man, deprives him of his property without due process of law, nor denies him equal protection of the laws within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. So this is the Supreme Court decision of 1896, a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities as long as the segregated facilities were equal in quality, a doctrine that became known as separate but equal. So as we look at this, Justice Page, we want to also get a sense of your own experience. So the Supreme Court gave us the idea of separate but equal, but while it was separate, it was never equal. So did you ever experience the separation firsthand in life, in law, or any other aspects of your life? You know, I probably have, but, well, not probably have, I have. I mean, as I say, we live in segregated communities today. We segregate ourselves by race. We segregate ourselves by wealth. Uh, we segregate ourselves by sexual orientation. We segregate ourselves all sorts of ways. And you can't live without experiencing that. But those who would segregate themselves from me. I've, I've always been of a view that that's their problem. That's not my problem. And I'm not going to take on their baggage. Their problem is not going to become my burden. I'm going to do what I can to um, make things better for myself in the situation that I'm in and for those around me and to help lift others up, but um, those who would segregate me, separate me, cast me as the other, I'm not gonna take on their burden. I think one of the, one of the challenges that those of us who um, look like you and I, the challenge is, how do we avoid taking on their burden? Because when we take on their burden, we become distracted. And isn't that really what they're trying to do? I, I'm not having any of it. And you know, you're right, separate but equal is never equal. Indeed, um, Brown versus the Board of Education made that clear when the court said, uh, referring to education, separate is inherently unequal. Inherently unequal by its nature. And the sad part is, as I alluded to earlier, we all lose in that because we lose the, the richness of what others have to bring to us. So as we continue on with this part of the conversation, I want to give a little homework. So as a professor, I'd be remiss if I don't share homework. Please, 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 you can pick up a copy through the Hennepin County Library System of CAS by Is Isabel Wilkerson. Yours truly is reading it right now. Because the next question I have for Justice Page, in light of knowing a few things, and I think we have to state this so we're all clear, we know that race is a social construct. We know that it's not rooted in biology and then it's reinforced, hence why Isabel Wilkerson's book is so critically important, by a CAS system. 
that then creates a taxonomic structure of who's good, who's bad, where they should be, and reinforces concepts like separate but equal. So here's my question for you, Justice Page, as we think about this, what role does law, do law and policies play in either addressing or eliminating some of these caste systems or related to race um, this, as a social construct? What role does, has law and policy play both in history and what role can they play in the future? Well, I noted earlier uh, Article One of our Constitution, the reference to those who were enslaved as three-fifths of a person. Our Constitution is grounded, rooted in slavery, in racial inequality, And our legal history is rooted in that. As you know, um, we look at the law, we look at precedent. We interpret con our Constitution um, in light of the views of the people who wrote it. The people who wrote it own slaves. The people who wrote it own slaves. And so grounded in that, even though the 13th Amendment comes along and ends slavery, even though the 14th Amendment comes along and ensures um, equal protection and due process to all, although there is the argument that the 14th Amendment's due process and equal protection provisions don't apply to women. Um, think about that for a moment. Let that sink in in the year 2021. Um, but, you know, given everything is based on president, precedent, we're rooted in that history. Until we can pull ourselves apart from that history, I'm not sure that, at least in terms of the law, that we can escape the binds of that system. I'm not sure we can. Um, I think it was William O. Douglas, and I can't remember the, the name of the case that he was referring to, but I think it had to do some, had something to do with, um, he, he wrote a concurrence or a dissent, I think it was a dissent, in a case involving juror selection and the exclusion of African Americans from jurors, juries. And he took us through the history of how African Americans had been excluded from juries even after the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment. Um, and he, he used this phrase he called it slavery unwilling to die. And as long as what we are doing is rooted in that past, we are connected to slavery unwilling to die. And, and Thinking about the future, we have the ability to be the founding fathers and mothers of the future. We have that power, all of us here this evening, all of us here in Minnesota, all of us here in the United States, we have the, we have the power to be the founding fathers and mothers for a future that is disconnected 
from that slaveholding past. I love that. The founding fathers and mothers of the future. So that's a reminder for, for us all of that power of testifying, to bear witness, to connect to history and make an impact. So the, the photo that you had just seen was actually a photo of, um, we were looking specifically as it relates to Plessy versus Ferguson. This is a picture of Homer Plessy. So we wanted to make sure that we put a face with a name, oftentimes overlooked, but this is Homer Plessy who helped to fight to tear down some of the barriers that Justice Page has outlined for us. The next piece is a piece of artwork. So we're gonna transition. The last pieces will be related to you. And what I love about Testify as Exhibition, it combines arts and humanities and faith, social justice, law, public policy, all together as one. So when I saw this, I immediately went to Justice Page, the Red Summer 1919. I started to think about the 17-year-old African-American boy named Eugene Williams. He was swimming with friends in Lake Michigan. And unfortunately, they said when he crossed the unofficial uh, barrier between the city's white and black beaches, a group of white men threw stones at Williams, hitting him, and he drowned. Um, so I think a part of it is, and it was a catalyst for many other things that happened as far as some of the racial tensions that we saw in 1919. But I want to illustrate that as a point in history that we didn't just have sit-ins, we had wait-ins, we even had read-ins. So it's ironic to be here in the library today. In many ways, it was restricted to us under those policies around Jim Crow. So I just want to get a sense of, Justice Page, when you see this painting, what are some of the feelings and sentiments that you experience? Well, this piece of, of art is a painting titled Only on Thursday. Think about it, only on Thursday. And why is it named only on Thursday? It's a scene from a swimming pool in Pasadena, California in the 1940s. You notice all the people in the pool are African-Americans. Well, it's titled only on Thursdays because that was the only day that African-Americans were allowed to swim in the pool. On Fridays, they clean the pool. Think about that. Think about what just that idea that you're only allowed in here once and we're going to clean it when you leave. What that does to the human spirit, what that does to one's soul on both sides of that question. It, 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 it was, it was when we saw it, um, we knew it was something that we had to have because it speaks to just how crazy bigotry can be. And the pools in um, Pasadena, I think until like 1946, 1947, it was that late before they actually changed their policies. So we want to acknowledge that only on Thursdays is a key painting in the exhibit from Burr Singer, a female Jewish painter whose work was very progressive in, for her era that she really, Singer's work is beloved by the Page family for the way she, cap she captured with such sympathy and warmth the humanity, joy, and expressiveness of African-Americans in an era when it was far from the norm. So we want to acknowledge Burr Singer. The next piece that you have is related to, and it's entitled Alligator Bait. It's from 1897. Um, it was presented, this image of these babies, next to a photo of an African-American Calvary Regiment from 1939. The juxtaposition of photos heighten the irony of African-Americans fighting for a home worth protecting while at the same time being subject to a deep tox toxic hostility. The honor they sought for the, their country was undermined when the rights and liberties they fought for were not available to them. And they were all surrounded by imagery determined to undermine their worth or deny it. 
So when we look at this image in particular, I was and initially I said, well, no, this couldn't be true. So it sent me on my own research path. And there is a particular article, another piece of homework. So after you recast or even at the same time, please look up an article that looks at and explores the history of alligator bait that is published online by the undefeated.com. Does a full layout and there was also a connection even to Minnesota and all Minnesota as it relates to this piece of the alligator gate uh, bait and how it was actually used and not a myth, not fiction of reality. So with that, Justice Page, I'll turn to you. We've seen in the news and everywhere surrounding us some very powerful images, images of despair, images of hope. So how do these images connect to the fight for justice? How do we connect the arts and humanities? How do we bring all these pieces together? We bring them together because that's who we are. That, that's, they are what we are. They represent who, what we look like, what we think, how we act, and how we treat each other. We depict ourselves in these images. That alligator bait piece, it both makes me sick to my stomach and brings tears to my eyes. Who would do that? Who would take photos of these beautiful children and present them in that manner? Who would do that? That said, you know, that doesn't have to be us. We can be different from that. But in order to be different from that, we have to know that that existed. And to know what that looks like and what that feels like. And then we have to, you know, look internally and say, well, what's my reaction to that? And how do I avoid being someone who would do something like that or something similar? And when I say we, I mean we, I mean me, I mean you, I mean everybody. It's not they. It's us. All of this is within us. You know, we we think about um, just reflecting for a minute on the death of George Floyd. That was done in our names. Think about it. That was done in our names. And it was done in our names because we allowed a system to exist that would let that happen. And so the question is, you know, you ask, is there hope for the future? The question is, what are we going to do to change that future? It's not going to change itself. We have to change it. And at this point, I think the jury is still out as to whether we are going to change it. So as we look at our, our final piece, I think this is the, the perfect bridge as we look at a piece entitled Jazz Musicians. And this is from 1940 by William S. Carter. And it says sometimes colors used to divide us and sometimes it's fully celebrated is in, in this work. So this is just the title and script from Testify the Exhibition. And it reminds us that jazz is here painted with a sense of urgency and necessity. The central figure stares audaciously at the viewer, while the figure on the right connects with his bandmate and the leftmost figure seems to gaze inward in a trance. Rays and vectors of sound seem to break through 
the plane of this canvas and burst into the air around it. So can you really feel it in the rhythm and the sound coming through? William Carter studied at the School of Art Institute of Chicago and was also part of the interdisciplinary group of African-American artists, writers, and thinkers known as the Chicago Renaissance. This group, they were political and socially engaged in different ways, flourishing with the support of the Federal Arts Project. And here's a quote from the artist, William Carter. He said, why should I paint about having to get on welfare and living in a poor neighborhood? Why should I let that reflect in my art? But that's what they expect you to do. Even now, as far removed as we are from the poverty of the WPA era, even now they want that to reflect in the work. I say, oh no, oh no. So when we think about this, how amazing is music? The different voices, the different sounds, but I think it also can tie directly into what Justice Page is outlining for us. As those new, and I'm gonna take this on, as the new founding fathers and mothers of the future who will anchor the future. We know this as a piece of creating a new harmony of those themes that Justice Page talked about, of justice, of freedom, of hope for the future. So when we think about this, we know that it's a certain type of energy that brings forth that collaboration. What are some of the metaphors or some of the tools that we can take from music to help lead us forward, Justice Page? Well, you know, you, you, you look at that piece and it just brings you alive. You can hear the music, even though there's no music. You can see the music. You can feel the hope. You can feel the energy. That's what music does. That's what we can do. That, you know, We've spent a lot of time this evening looking at artifacts from the past. Most of them from the dark side of history. There are just as many on the bright side of history. That last piece was just one of the ones we have where the hope and the energy comes through. The, the, the sense of even during the dark times, there is light. That we are not confined and defined by the ugly side of things. That through it all, I think hope springs eternal. That when we put our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our energy, our artistry, our intellect to the task, we can change the future. We can change the future in ways that make it better than brighter than we could hardly have ever imagined. Well, we know in that in the faith tradition, when we hear what we've heard today through the exhibition of Testify, from the past to the present, and that the past is the present, we are reminded of that affirmation where we say amen. Amen to the ideals that have been set forth on how we can move forward. Now you've had an opportunity. Some of you have shared some initial questions. So Justice Page, we have some questions from the live audience. The first one is from Kevin. Kevin would like to know, what is your opinion of the fact that there are history books um, are being removed removing history from being taught in schools. So some of the changes that we see with history books being removed that are teaching the history, incomplete pieces of history, how do we address this? Well, to the extent that the history books have had incomplete and inaccurate history, I would say good riddance. But that doesn't mean we stop using history in schools. We replace those books with books with an accurate history. You know, it's it's trite, I suppose, but it's very true. If we don't know our history, we are doomed to repeat it. 
we are doomed to repeat it. When you when you when you don't have any awareness of many of those artifacts that we saw, what they represent, and the events, the the facts that they represent, when we aren't aware of that, it's easy to fall back into that trap. You think about the Holocaust. There are those who would like to pretend that that didn't happen. And if we don't keep those reminders out there, it is easy to go backwards. One of the reasons that Diane and I have collected so many of these artifacts is to make sure that we don't forget. I had any number of them um, hanging in my office in my chambers at the court precisely so that I wouldn't forget our history, that I wouldn't forget that the world has not always, our country and our law has not always treated all people fairly. And when I say all people, I mean all people. You know, we've we've treated some better than others. And I needed for me that daily reminder so that I would never forget who my responsibility was to. And that responsibility was to ensure fairness, ensure equal justice under all circumstances. Thank you, Justice Page. So that, that's a reminder to keep these artifacts in mind and in places that are visible to hold us all accountable. So I think even about my office, there's a picture of you, Justice Page, in my office as that reminder of that testament of remain in focus and not to break the tablets at work or in the courtroom. So I, I keep it as a reminder to stay anchored. There's also a picture that I have very prominent of Congressman John Lewis, of meeting with him and talking about how do we continue to educate young people in some meaningful ways. Next, we have Jill Castle, who asks, how do we best elevate and amplify oppressed voices in safe spaces, such as Black affinity resources groups, while also building connectivity with white folks? I think we have to amplify those voices in non-safe places. We have to amplify those voices in all places. I think it's that simple that we can't go to our separate corners, our separate bunkers and expect others to get to know us. And, and that doesn't mean we have to give up who we are, our, our identity and our commonness with certain groups, but it does mean we can't be so isolated that I'm over here, you're over there, and we never meet in the middle. Because the reality is that we have far more in common than we are different, far more in common. I mean, I thank you. Quite, quite frankly, I've never understood. You know, I mean, intellectually, I see it, I know it, and I understand it, sort of. But why, because of the color of my skin, you don't want me as a customer? You don't want my money? 
Why? Because of my gender, you have some other hang up with me? And you don't want me to help you? I logically that makes no sense to me. But you know, you 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 refer to Isabel Wilkerson's cast. She talks about how the need to feel superior to some other group causes us to do things that are against our own self-interest. I mean, from my vantage point, if you want a definition of insanity, that's a pretty good one. So you, the last question that we have for you, Justice Page, really connects the dots because the, the first time I, just personally that I heard the conversation about safe spaces was not in an employment setting. It was as a college student and then working in colleges to hear the message that we need to create safe spaces. And we've heard it from you then, uh, Justice Page, the importance of tearing down barriers and making the whole space safe for engagement for building community. So the next piece and the final question is directly related to education. This is from Carrie. Justice Page is no secret that racial inequality in public school in the Twin Cities is a problem. How do you think we can go about starting to fix such a large and systemic issue? Well, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but I've been involved in an effort to amend Minnesota's constitutional education clause to guarantee every child, all children, a civil right to a quality public education. That's my effort. Um, and so anybody that wants to help out with that effort, I think that, you know, where you have a system that systematically holds certain classes and groups of people down, which our education system, and it's not just here in the Twin Cities, it's in rural Minnesota. Economically disadvantaged white kids suffer the same kind of disparities that African-American kids in um, North Minneapolis indigenous kids in South Minneapolis, brown kids in, um, I mean, all kids, wherever they may be, should have a civil right to a quality education. And we have to demand it. We absolutely have to demand it. What we have done with education is unconscionable and should be unacceptable. But yet, year in and year out, we tinker around the edges. The fact is when you have a system that systematically disadvantages certain children, that system has to change. It, 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 the system can't be fixed. The system has to change. Thank you for that question. That question leaves us on the note that takes us throughout the whole experience this evening that change begins with you and I. So really Justice Page is leaving you with a call to action, a call to action to take what you've learned today. Just don't hold it for yourself. Learning is a gift. So please share it with someone else. Share about some of the artifacts that you've seen. Take that challenge of learning more by reading CAS, by expanding your own learning experiences and notice even checking those biases that Justice Page talked about as well. So we'd like to conclude with giving honor and expressing gratitude. I think this would be a moment for me 
where I would make sure we had a standing ovation for Justice Page and the late Diane Sims Page, that they took energy, time, strength to curate this collection for us to tell the story of American history. And I'll base it upon my final words of that piece of, we talk about it in the humanities. And once again, it wouldn't be possible for me to even understand the humanities or the arts if I was not a paid scholar. I was a first generation student that didn't have a lot of hope for the future, but I got that golden ticket in the mail that was signed by Justice Page and Mrs. Page that I would be a paid scholar in 1999. And it changed the course of my history, not just for me individually, but as a part of my service project as I reached out to other young people, but changed my family history as well. So as we think about the power of education and learning and reaching back and education as a civil right, I was a direct, direct recipient of that labor of love and commitment of the Page Education Foundation. So I end with a sense of gratitude, but gratitude is not enough. We have to take gratitude, couple it with action. And now I want you to create a legacy of action and change within your own sphere of influence. You may not be able to create the Page Education Foundation, but you could help one scholar. You may not be able to go to law school and learn about all these laws and policies that Justice Page and I had an opportunity to discuss and analyze tonight, but you can lead change where you are by serving in your community, the foundational tenet of the Page Education Foundation. So Justice Page, a heartfelt gratitude in honor of the late Mrs. Diane Sims Page, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you as a scholar, thank you as a learner, and thank you as a community member that you shared this gift of knowledge and this compelling call to action with all of us. Well, thank you, Artika. And let me, let me also thank the Minneapolis Central Library, the Hennepin County Libraries. A special thanks to daughter Georgie, who put in countless hours to make this evening happen. And let me just echo what you said just a minute ago. We, each and every one of us, have it within us. If we're willing to act, to change the future, to bring justice to all. When we act, and it is through our actions, whether they be big, small, collectively, when we act, we bend the moral arc of history towards justice. And if ever, we needed to be about the task of bending the arc. It is now. Thank you all for being here. Unmute myself here. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Tyner and uh, Justice Page for your time tonight. That was a very wonderful uh, evening we had tonight. Uh, that was very tremendous. Um, we are very, we're very fortunate to have you share your insights uh, on, the, on these exhibits. And hopefully they're more than food for thought, but a call to action. As Justice Page said, we need to deal with the past at this, and at the same time work towards the future. As we wrap up, I'd like to thank Dr. Tanner and Justice Page for their for their time with us and the others that worked on this event to make it possible. Librarian Kimberly Nicholson worked behind the scenes tonight and Patricia Zagros with the Hennepin County IT and especially the Diane and Alan Page Collection uh, Director, Georgie Page Smith. We have recorded tonight's program and will be posted on the library's YouTube page and other places going forward. So you can look for that later. Uh, please be sure to fill out the survey and the link for your feedback. The next program from the Hennepin County Central Library History Discussion Group will be on April 29th from 3 to 4 p.m. on settlement houses in the Twin Cities. So be sure to watch the library's event page for that. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.